Katherine Crater. I'm a social worker at the LSU Health Shreveport Feistweiler Cancer Center in Shreveport, Louisiana. I'm here to talk with you on behalf of the ACCC's education program entitled the Financial Information and Learning Network for Community-Based Cancer Programs. The focus of this video is to explore the reasons that patients and families may need more assistance from financial counselors to meet the consumer's end of the financial agreement. And also we'll talk about the way that experienced financial counselors benefit both the institution's bottom line and the patient and family's needs. Let's talk first to understand the difference between financial noncompliance versus treatment noncompliance. Financial noncompliance refers to the patient or the financially responsible party not providing or not completing documentation that is necessary to meet their financial responsibility for treatment. An example would be a patient who is eligible for copay assistance but does not complete an application that would lead to reimbursement for the portion of their bill that is left after insurance pays. Treatment noncompliance, on the other hand, more specifically refers to not adhering to the medical recommendations for the most effective and safe therapy, including any needed lifestyle or dietary changes. You might see this in a patient who does not show up for a scheduled appointment. Some patients are noncompliant in both areas while other patients are non-compliant only in one aspect of care. For example, an uninsured patient is admitted to the emergency room, receives a cancer diagnosis, leaves the hospital against medical advice, and does not submit their paperwork to qualify for Medicaid. This leaves the hospital with a bill that will not be collectible. This patient is non-compliant with both financial and treatment issues. Other patients may delay completing applications for Medicaid or other applicable assistance, but they will ask for help to obtain a particular medication. They understand treatment compliance. However, these patients aren't managing the paperwork to give them consistent financial access to care. Let's speak about shared goal setting. It's just the nature of human beings that we are more cooperative with a plan that has direct benefit to us. We also prefer to feel that we determined or at least substantially influence the plan. Feeling out of control with a new cancer diagnosis or recurrence tends to heighten our need to control our financial affairs. The initial aspect of financial counseling has to be identifying the patient and their family's concerns and priorities. The simple statement, help me understand what seems most important to you right now, followed by attentive listening, it is an important step in establishing a relationship that really conveys you are focused on patient and family-centered care. Those concerns and their priorities are typically going to revolve around the patient's recovery. Paying the bill is not normally the patient or family's first thought. However, it is a legitimate concern for the fiscal stability and the continued operation of an oncology care provider. The shared territory is that oncology providers and patients and families all want the patient to recover, to be free from stress, and to have a long and happy life unencumbered by medical debt. The financial counselor's ability to really establish that rapport with the patient and family and clearly convey support for the emphasis on physical recovery is key to then establishing some shared goals about financial responsibilities and financial assistance programs. Let's talk a little bit about some of the reasons that people are financially noncompliant. Often people are trying to balance their treatment with their medical needs in their life um, and the financial issues. For instance, we had a, a woman in her mid-40s who had a daughter who was in junior high. The mother, or the child was convinced rather that her mother was dying and she was getting into trouble at school. Does her mother go to the school and act as a mama and take care of her child's emotional needs? Or does she get her Medicaid application finished? Sometimes our patients are really having to make those choices. And you can understand when you step back that there are life issues at that moment or more pressing to them than finishing the financial applications. Cancer also brings financial burdens that are unexpected and unusual for many patients. Patients and families may quietly do without rather than directly ask for assistance. They may not know that there is help available or they may be embarrassed about needing help when they've always been able to manage their daily living expenses. For example, we may see patients cutting or skipping a medicine dose to stretch out their prescription. They understand that the treatment is necessary, but they can't afford it. 
And rather than say that to us directly, they just don't quite take the medicine that they're supposed to. But it does have an impact on their physical recovery. Fear and anxiety can be paralyzing to even educated and competent patients. Patients or family members have many new tasks to assume in cooperating with treatment. The financial task may be another unfamiliar role. For instance, we had a patient who had a young daughter, uh, mid-20s, who was suddenly trying to complete her mother's Medicaid application. The mom had worked through several recurrences of her cancer, but she had a crisis, a medical crisis, and was all of a sudden unable to work. She was unable to provide income for herself. She was unable physically to take care of her financial paperwork. Her daughter came from out of state and tried to help her mother, but was really not able to complete those things in a timely way either. As I talked more with the daughter, I realized that she had put her life on hold as a young adult and was really trying hard to take care of her mother and felt that obligation. She understood what I needed from her, but she didn't have that information. She had not lived with her mother in several years. She, as a young adult, really wasn't familiar with a lot of the business terms that we were talking about. She needed me to directly intervene, to really sit with her and teach her some things that seemed to be fairly basic, like about bank statements and how do you get those. When I talked with her very directly, very simply, about exactly what we needed to complete the applications, the daughter was more than willing, but it took that time and the intervention from me to really help her to be compliant with treatment. Even people who are generally educated may not be savvy about financial matters like insurance coverage, financial terms, long-term financial decision making. We don't typically retain details until they are important to us. For example, if I asked you today if your health insurance covers allogeneic stem cell transplant, would you know that answer? Would you know what your designated centers of excellence are to get the best in-network cost share? Without an immediate need to know this information, very few people could recite the details of their health insurance policy. Yet when a person is suddenly diagnosed with cancer, their lack of knowledge about their cancer policy, their health insurance, their short-term disability benefits, those long-term disability benefits, all of that becomes a significant obstacle to quickly find the care that will minimize their out-of-pocket burdens. Another issue sometimes is that we see people who are not forthright about their financial status or their assets if they fear that their resources will be consumed for treatment and that they will be left bankrupt as a cancer survivor. Or what often feels worse to people is to believe that they will die and leave their family with that debt burden. Some people will have communication obstacles like illiteracy, lack of English language skills, poor vision or poor hearing, and those things can also be issues in being able to complete an application. For instance, if a patient is hospitalized and they don't have their glasses with them and you give them a form, are they going to be able to complete that? We need to balance financial responsibility to our institution and customer goodwill and public relations. It is morally and legally prudent for an oncology provider to strive for financial solvency and to openly disclose our financial practices. Seeking to collect appropriate reimbursement is a reasonable business practice. We need to protect our institution's financial viability if we intend to remain available for future patients. Catching more flies with honey than vinegar is an old folk expression. However, there is wisdom in understanding that how we approach patients and families about financial compliance and financial responsibility can either create and sustain community goodwill or create a public image of greed and insensitivity. Business managers should support the counseling and customer service skills of employees on the front line of financial counseling. Financial counselors, whether they are based in an admitting department, a business department, or in a social work department, make treatment financially accessible to patients. They also protect the financial health of the employer. These staff members need continuing education, skilled mentors and supervisors, and appreciation in their daily duties. Your financial counselors are an investment in your institution's public reputation as a place of healing that will be in business for many years. For more information and resources developed as part of the ACCC's education project, the Financial Information Learning Network and the Community-Based Cancer Program, please visit the website listed on the screen.